Um, so I do want to welcome everybody to the University of Michigan Concussion Center special panel discussion on concussion and long-term neurological health. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Steve Rollio. I'm the director of the center here. Um, and here at the center, we, you know, we're really trying to strive to bring you the best speakers um, from around the world. And today we're going to hear and learn from some of the best on concussion, concussion researchers and clinicians. Um, before we get started, um, I have a, do have a few housekeeping items for everybody. Um, the session is being recorded today, uh, and it will be available on our website, concussion.umich.edu, in a few days. Um, after I introduce each of the panelists, I'm going to ask that they give a few brief remarks about the research, um, but the session is largely designed for the audience to ask questions. The chat function has been turned off, but you can enter your questions or comments in the Q&A that's located at the bottom of the screen. Okay, uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Raquel, I think you're on, but if you can turn your camera on, that would be great. Let's start with Raquel, Dr. Raquel Gardner. She's an associate professor of neurology at the Wheel Institute uh, for Neurosciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Raquel's research program focuses on understanding the epidemiology and mechanisms of long-term sequelae for traumatic brain injury in older adults with the goal of improving outcomes in this population. More specifically, Raquel is part of the TRAC TBI Geriatric TBI Working Group and PI of track Jerry, which is a study focusing on those 65 and older, as well as PI of track VA, a study enrolling veterans 65 and older. Uh, our other speaker on the screen here is Dr. Tom McAllister. He is the Albert Eugene Stern Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Indiana University School of Medicine. Tom's been working in the field uh, of brain injury for about 25, over 25 years. He's written widely on neuropsychiatric sequela of TBI and has been the PI on numerous grants exploring the nature of cognitive and behavioral difficulties following moderate and mild and moderate TBI. He's currently co-PI of the recently funded Care Saltos Integrated Study, also known as CSI, that will evaluate brain health in former NCAA varsity athletes, military service academy members up to 10 years following graduation. Uh, and in full disclosure, I'm also a co-PI on that grant. Um, we are still working on getting Bill Meehan in, so when he joins, I will uh, give his introduction. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to give a brief intro about the research. I'm going to turn it over to Raquel and then Tom, and then I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that Bill will be in at that point. So Raquel, do you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you so much, Stephen, for inviting me. I'm just going to share my screen. I just have a, a few slides. Um, all right, so um, since I only have about maybe two or three minutes to give an overview of some of the work I'm doing, um, since we're talking about chronic effects, instead of talking about the work I do with geriatric traumatic brain injury, which is more about subacute, I'd say acute and subacute effects, um, I just wanted to tell a bit of a story about how I first became interested in studying long-term effects of TBI. I'm a dementia neurologist by training. Um, and so I, I started to become interested in, in the links between TBI and dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases early on in my career. Um, and I think at this point, I'll venture to say that traumatic brain injury, <clears throat> including mild TBI, is an established risk factor for dementia and Parkinson's disease. Whether that's a direct causal link, I think is, is what a lot of people are interested in, but it's certainly been shown to be a very significant risk factor in multiple studies. Um, and so when I first got into this field, I thought, well, perhaps older adults in the early stage of undiagnosed dementia or Parkinson's disease are simply more likely to fall. And this is really what's subserving this association and the arrow goes in the other direction, it's reverse causation. So um, one of the very first studies that I did um, to try to dig a little deeper into this question was to look at California-wide hospital data um, where I basically matched several thousand older people, middle-aged and older people who sustained a traumatic brain injury to several uh, hundred thousand who had a uh, broken limb. And so the only difference was that one group fell and hit their head, one group fell and broke a leg or broken arm. So very, very well matched. The only difference really was the location of the trauma. Um, and I thought that this would be a really good population to sort of cleanly answer this question of whether traumatic brain injury indeed is a risk factor for dementia. And we found in fact that it was even in this very matched group um, uh, that was followed for just a few years after the injury, five to seven years, they were 26% more likely to get dementia. Um, we found an interaction with age and severity. So it seems that 
you know, at least as people get into older and older age and especially oldest old age, that risk of dementia, even from a very mild injury, like a mild TBI becomes, um, you know, as, as much as that of a more severe TBI. Um, we looked at the same, in the same data set at risk of Parkinson's disease, we also found that risk to be elevated by about 44% um, and found um, that it didn't matter if they had sustained their injury from a fall or not from a fall. Um, there was a dose effect for severity and a dose effect for frequency. So I think that's that's pretty much where I'll end my intro. That was what sort of got me interested in this topic. And now I've spent the last several years trying to really understand why is it that some people go on to develop dementia and Parkinson's disease after a traumatic brain injury and others don't. So at the moment, I'm really interested in risk and resiliency factors. Um, there have been several meta-analyses over the past several years, you know, and all have pretty much, um, you know, landed on, you know, a small but definitely increased risk of neurodegenerative disease after single TBI and even, um, you know, whether it's mild or more severe. So I think is that about my two or three minutes, Stephen? Um, so so I, I can end there. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really looking forward to this uh, discussion. Great. That's awesome. Thanks, Raquel. Appreciate it. Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you to give a little uh, background on your work, please. Okay, well, after your introduction, Steve, uh, apparently I'm old enough to uh, participate in some of Raquel's studies. So if you're looking for some additional subjects, Raquel, just call me. Um, so uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Um, just want to highlight uh, the the area of uh, TBI that uh, I've been working in um, most recently over the last seven or eight years with Steve and also Mike McRae and Paul Pasquina on the CARE Consortium. So our interest has been in looking at the effects of uh, concussion, whether it's single or multiple concussion, and repetitive head impact exposure. So people who hit their heads a lot and uh, are not diagnosed with a concussion. Um, in college age um, athletes and military service academies. And that became known as the CARE Consortium. We had uh, 30 uh, sites, four service academies and uh, 26 um, civilian universities and colleges across all divisions. And basically the design here was, um, we'll take all comers who are varsity athletes. Um, so this was not a football study. This was a, um, um, an athlete study basically initially in a service academy study. So teams would um, um, in, invite all varsity athletes uh, and women, contact sport, non-contact sport, and so forth. They would undergo a series of baseline assessments. And then when identified as having a concussion, uh, they would have um, additional uh, assessments at uh, five uh, time points. And a subgroup of those folks um, um, were also studied more intensively with multimodal MRI uh, biomarkers, uh, fluid biomarkers, and um, uh, the football players uh, and uh, female ice hockey players uh, wore uh, head impact um, uh, sensors so that we could get a sense of uh, magnitude and frequency of impacts as well. So that was the basic design. Um, thanks largely to Steve and his team's uh, efforts, we were able to enroll some 50,000 plus uh, athletes uh, over uh, the first, whatever, five or six years, time flies here. Um, that's how it got to be 30 years in the field, I guess. And um, the, uh, in addition, we're able to collect data on some 5,000 or so folks with concussion. So we've been uh, working our way through that data. Uh, and then uh, in addition, um, moved from the acute effects. So the idea was, let's take a look at what happens in the first six months uh, after a concussion to more uh, cumulative and intermediate effects. So we added an additional assessment point um, when our participants left university or left the service academy. So taking a look at comparing how they looked when they came in uh, and uh, then four years later, and again, drawing contrast between those who were concussed, those who were not concussed, but had exposure and those who were neither. Um, and just recently, as Steve mentioned, we're fortunate enough to um, uh, talk folks into uh, the value of uh, following um, this cohort uh, for the, uh, another five years so that uh, we will be able to begin to take a look at um, whether there are um, brain health um, effects of exposure and concussion uh, 
um, up to 10 years or more um, after the exposure. So uh, not uh, at the uh, far end of the uh, continuum that Raquel was talking about, which I think is the great way Steve put this panel together. Um, but I think uh, when we get um, some of these studies from different uh, ends of the age spectrum, I think hopefully we'll put it together and be able to have a bigger picture of what, what um, the impact is, so to speak, of, uh, of head impacts and concussion. So um, let me finish there. I'm sure we can get into greater details uh, if people are interested, but um, that's the short story. Great. Thanks, Tom. Bill, thanks for joining. <laughs> Last but not least, um, I, got a, I got a little intro for you, and then we're going to let you uh, give a little description of some of your work. So Bill, is, Bill Meehan is the director of the Michelli Center for Sports Injury Prevention, director of research for the Brain Injury Center at the Boston Children's Hospital, as an associate professor of pediatrics and orthopedics at Harvard Medical School. He is the PI for the Neurologic Function Across the Lifespan, a prospective longitudinal translational study of former National Football League players, otherwise known as NFL Long. So, Bill, I will let you uh, give a little background on your work in the space, and then we will get into some questions. That's great. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you to Drs. Gardner and McAllister for, for being willing to sit next to me. I'm sure that's a step down for the both of them. Uh, the NFL long study is a, a, a cohort study to do three main things. One is to characterize the overall neurological health of former NFL players. I think a lot of us feel like we know what that is from reading the media, but um, there's some things we might talk about today that, that might make that assessment somewhat inaccurate. Um, and it's to determine whether or not their current state of neurological health is associated with concussions they stayed while they played or perhaps um, just their longevity or the years that they were exposed to tackle football uh, overall. And so far we have about 1,800 men who are a part of the study. We particularly focus on those between the ages of 50 to 70 and we have about 500 or so of them. Uh, and then in addition, I, I co-run a traumatic brain injury laboratory that studies animal models of traumatic brain injury and in particular repeated mild traumatic brain injury to determine the effects of repetitive mild traumatic brain injury on later life function, uh, but also the determinants of those outcomes. Are there things we can do to intervene um, that might attenuate some of those outcomes? And then lastly, potential uh, treatments and preventative measures that might help with some of the long-term sequelae. And if people are interested, I'd love to get into that during the Q&A session. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. So um, as our, uh, our viewers can see, we have a pretty nice cross-section of panelists here today um, investigating long-term effects of concussion and mild TBI, um, so spanning civilians and former NCAA athletes, military service members, former professional athletes. Um, so uh, we, we put this together intentionally so we can run the gamut, so to speak. Um, and I'm going to encourage our audience to submit questions, but I have one here um, that uh, I'm going to start off with, a little bit of a softball just to get us rolling. Uh, and I will open it up to everybody. What is CTE and can you describe the pathophysiology? Uh, well, we can we can do this as a, as a, as a team effort here. Uh, CTE being chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, and it's the term that's been applied to a neuropathological um, set of findings um, reported initially uh, back in the day in the 1920s in professional boxers uh, with multiple concussions. And then subsequently, uh, when a similar neuropathological uh, picture was found in professional um, football players um, in the um, at the turn of the century, I would say, um, it became um, uh, more apparent that it wasn't just boxing that was the, the evil here, but it might be repetitive concussions in a variety of settings. Uh, in particular, um, football was the immediate concern initially, and then it um, became uh, of concern in, in military um, uh, personnel, particularly with the advent of uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan um, and the advent of um, improvised uh, uh, explosive devices with a high frequency of mild traumatic brain injury. And um, basically um, that ended up in the uh, neuropathological syndrome being renamed chronic traumatic encephalopathy since 
it no longer fit to call it dementia pugilistica or uh, boxer's dementia that didn't make sense uh, as much anymore. So it was meant to convey that this was something that was more associated with um, a variety of different uh, types of um, environmental situations in which people sustain multiple uh, impacts to the head and multiple concussions. Um, I, I think I will defer to my neurological colleague uh, to perhaps describe some of the um, uh, the neuropathological uh, pattern uh, there. Uh, Dr. Gardner, would you like to uh, carry on? Or? Um, sure. So, <clears throat> well, CTE itself is is at this point a neuropathological diagnosis, which now has consensus neuropathological criteria that. Um, are based on a certain pattern of deposition of tau for the most part um, in depths of sulci and, and several other neuropathological features. Um, in terms of, I mean, I think part of the question also was sort of not just the neuropathology, right? So, I mean, in terms of the, the clinical presentations of CTE, you know, what is that? Um, so it turns out that there's a, a huge variety of symptoms that have been described in people who've gone on to receive this neuropathological diagnosis. Um, there have been cases of patients who look for all the world like they have Alzheimer's disease and um, go on to, to have CT on autopsy. There are others who look perhaps a little bit more like they have a psychiatric illness with rage and, explo and uh, explosive rage disorder, right? So there's, there's quite a spectrum and others look like they have Parkinson's disease, right? Or any combination of, of those features and, and, and others. And so um, I think a part of why it's been so tough to come up with, with clinical criteria um, and perhaps criteria for the traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, which um, Tom has, has advanced, um, is because there is such a range, right, of, of clinical presentations um, in, in patients who've, who've been diagnosed at autopsy with CT. Um, of course, this is true for, for many neurodegenerative diseases, right? Alzheimer's itself, right? The very first description of Alzheimer's disease was actually a patient who had an atypical presentation, who had a frontal behavioral presentation, right? Which is absolutely not what we typically think of when we think of Alzheimer's disease. So, so I'd say, you know, CTE is not unique in that it has a variety of clinical presentations, um, but it, it, you know, it, it, I think that there's some emerging evidence that maybe there are, are certain aspects of behavioral dysregulation that are unifying, that are more often present than not. Um, so I don't know, it's a big question to ask what is CTE. Right. So uh, I hope that shed a little bit. I don't know, Bill, if you have anything else to add. I would just compliment Dr. Gardner on her wording of it. I thought it was absolutely perfect that, that you know, there are cases who were this and cases who displayed that. And, um, and the reason I say that is normally the way we do it is we, we would have a pathological diagnosis and we would say, oh, those who had the pathology consistent with Parkinson's disease, say, just as an example, were more likely to have mask-like faces and tremors, et cetera. And, and that's how you know that those are the symptoms of it. And of course, with CTE, that hasn't been done yet. We sort of, we, we kind of threw the risk factors and the definition and everything all into it at once from the beginning. And now we're going back and trying to tease it out. So I thought both uh, both, both your answer and Dr. McAllister's was, was perfect because I find it hard to determine any really uh, symptoms or signs that have been shown to be more associated with CTE. And so I, I'm reluctant to attribute anything to it yet. I mean, I expect there will be. It's unlikely you have neurodegeneration without it, but I just don't know what they are. Great, thank you. So a little bit of a follow-up, you know, we, we talk about CTE, we talk about phosphorylated tau. Is the phosphorylated tau the cause of the neurological issues, the clinical symptoms, signs and symptoms we see, or is it a marker of another injury? Or do we know? I thought this was supposed to be a softball question, Steve. Oh, the, last, the last one was the softball. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, we might as well get right into it. I don't, I don't think we know. I think the, um, the uh, tau, uh, as, as Raquel was saying, is, is certainly one of the hallmarks uh, of the neuropathology in people who have been diagnosed with um, CTE. Uh, you can also see other kinds of proteinopathies associated with people who have um, 
uh, had brain injury um, and in fact, who are diagnosed with CTE. So while I think it's a, um, uh, a significant marker, it should not be concluded that any little speck of tau somewhere in somebody's brain um, means that you have uh, CTE. You can also have um, uh, amyloid, uh, you can have uh, synuclein deposits and so forth. There's any number of different uh, proteinopathies that you can see associated with, with TBI. And I think that's what um, um, makes this whole topic really sort of challenging and interesting uh, at the same time. But I think if we go back to the days when um, we called everything dementia, and then we said, oh, well, actually there's Alzheimer's, and then, oh, well, actually now there's uh, frontotemporal dementia, and then there's Parkinson's and dementia associated with that. This is a very common, and we've seen this before, right? Um, the more we learn, the more we delve into it, um, the more mechanistic we get, you can begin to um, you know, discern certain patterns that Tom, we, uh, something happened and you got muted. Can you, I'm sure it was a great answer though you were giving. Wow, that's weird. Um, <laughs> More I, mechanistic I, and patterns and. I, de I didn't mean to auto censor myself, but. Um, <laughs> That, you know, the more we, the more mechanistic we get. I think we uh, found that um, you could see different behavior, neural behavioral patterns, different patterns of cognitive deficit associated with uh, proteinopathies in uh, particular brain locations. And I, I suspect that we will see a similar kind of picture um, over time emerge in in TBI. But uh, love to hear Bill and, and Raquel's uh, view of that. Because this is just an unfrozen caveman psychiatrist view of, uh, of what's going on here. Bill, Raquel, anything to add? Oh, Raquel, you're on mute there. Oh, they can't unmute. <laughs> I mean, all sorts of technology okay. issues. Great. Yeah, there was a, I think you had the controls for a moment, Steve. Okay. Oh. Um, great. So, so yeah, does, does, the p -tau cause CTE? I mean, does the p -tau cause Alzheimer's disease? I think we can't even answer that question. We've been studying Alzheimer's disease for a whole lot longer. Um, so, you know, I, I really liked Tom's answer. Um, you know, I think um, that we can sort of say at this point, you know, that the repetitive head impact seems to be the initiator, right, of whatever process is going on in CTE. And then there's a whole lot of steps, right, between that and then the, the clinical manifestations, right, that a patient has. And, and certainly, um, you know, I believe there've been some cases of, of, you know, very minimal hyperphosphorylated tau that have been found, you know, by Dr. McKee's group in young people, right? Young football players who have minimal symptoms or maybe only a little bit of Psychiatric symptoms. I guess most of, most of the time these are these are maybe more dramatic psychiatric manifestations, but not necessarily, you know, neurodegeneration, right? So so is it the tau, or is is there something else going on, and the tau is sort of just a an innocent bystander, sort of something that's being deposited in the context of of another process, which is actually um, causing, if you will, you know, these symptoms that these very young people are having. I mean. I can't recall the, the precise case. I don't know if Tom or Bill recall, but you know, I know there was one case that had just, you know, the, the tracest amount of, of P tau that Anne presented. And, and I believe it was a young person who, who had committed suicide from um, psychiatric illness, right? So, you know, um, in that situation, I would be hesitant to say that, that the P tau was reflective of the magnitude of brain disease that that individual had, right? So I actually think the animal models could help us here. And I, I don't know, is it okay to share some slides from, from the work from our lab? But um, maybe I'll tell you what they, they say and you can tell me if you want to see the slides. But um, uh, certainly there's a uh, hyperphosphorylated tau and uh, the animal models would suggest that's really a late finding. But that tau itself comes in different conformations. So for the, the, the people who aren't familiar, tau is a, a naturally occurring and necessary element of brain function. It helps stabilize microtubules to allow you to transport proteins from one end of an axon to another. And um, trauma will induce it to change into a cis conformation, which is thought to be toxic. And when that happens, 
um, the microtubules will break down and you'll get neuronal dysfunction and ultimately neuronal degeneration. You can induce the cyst conformation with trauma if it's severe enough. And if it's um, not mild the way we think of it as sport related, I mean, the, the, the mice that sustain these injuries will, 20% um, of them will have seizures, they will be unconscious for minutes on end, but, but nonetheless, um, they don't have gross structural injury. And you can induce the cyst conformation or the toxic conformation by doing that, and it leads to neurodegeneration. Um, furthermore, if you just take the lysate of brains that had cyst tau or even purified cyst tau, and you inject it into the brains of an uninjured animal, you will induce the neurodegenerative process. So I, I don't know, is it hyperphosphorylated tau? Of course, mice are different than people. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of work to be done, but I would say the animal modeling suggests that, that there is a toxic form of tau that will lead to neurodegeneration that can be induced by trauma. It can also be induced by hypoxia. Um, and then some of the clinical pathological studies not done on athletes suggest it could be induced by substance abuse and, and whether or not that's secondary to hypoxia or something, I just don't know yet. So um, I'll leave it there. Interesting stuff. All right, we're starting to get some questions from the audience. So we'll take the first one here. Um, so some of this, and Raquel, you, you sort of touched on this. Um, there's a suggestion that neurological impairment risk is increased with concussion um, and or head impact exposure. Um, so it's sort of the idea that you know, the more that you hit your head, the greater the risk and your data support that. Do we know this interplay? Is it just concussion? Is it just, or TBI for that matter? Or is it just head impact exposure or combination that you have to have both, just one or to be determined? I think you, everybody's been muted again. I'm not sure what's going on because I don't feel like I'm bumping buttons. Unmute. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right. Um, okay, so the question is, um, what amount of head trauma do you need to have an increased risk of, of Parkinson's disease or dementia? Is that sort of the question? Like, is a subconcussive hit enough or is a concussive hit enough? Is that sort of the question? Like, what's the threshold? Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. So, um, so, so I don't think that we can necessarily say exactly what the threshold is, right? So based on the, the epidemiological studies that I've done, um, other similar studies where you're looking at, you know, large administrative cohorts, um, you know, basically we can say that someone who's been diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury, right, has an increased risk of, of dementia and Parkinson's disease, right? Um, I'm not aware yet of any study with you know, a large enough sample size, right? We're and we're talking about small increase, right? We were talking about anywhere from 20 to 70% increased risk. And so to have sufficient power to look at that, you need, you know, several thousands, a very large cohort. So I, I don't think we know yet, right? If a subconcussive injury, which wouldn't be captured in hospital records, right? Hospital data, you know, would also be associated. The, the, you know, we did do a study in nationwide VA data. This was led by Christine Yaffe as part of the DOD and VA funded chronic effects of neurotrauma consortium, um, where we actually used ICD-9 and 10 codes to define TBI without loss of consciousness. So that's kind of the most mild TBI I've seen in an administrative data set study. Um, and this was led by Dead Barnes. And so even mild TBI without loss of consciousness was associated with a significantly increased risk of dementia in veterans in nationwide VA data, right? Um, and that risk was, it was actually about twofold, right? And so it's interesting, we've seen slightly higher risk ratios in veterans than, than civilians um, in the VA data than in say the California data. Um, but I, I don't think we can necessarily say, what I would, I would expect is that it's probably on a continuum, right? I mean, I think if a lot of brain trauma is bad, very bad for your brain, a little bit of brain trauma is a little bit bad for your brain, right? So, you know, I don't know if we can necessarily say that there's a, a, a precise threshold beyond which you'll have a problem. And this is the case in so many environmental and occupational exposures and, and disease outcomes, right? Bill, Tom, any follow-up on that or we can move on to the next yeah. one? Um, can you hear me or am I muted? We can hear you now. Yeah, no, I think, um, I love this. I, you know, we, uh, a while ago, and Steve, you've done uh, uh, a lot of this work as well, but the notion that we could define a threshold um, at which um, somebody gets a concussion was very seductive and unfortunately um, very false and uh, turned out to be a holy grail. So when 
you know, uh, collectively groups began to put sensors in helmets and let's just stipulate that those are not perfect markers for the magnitude of impacts, but they're not bad. They're better than what we had before. And the issue was that um, the, uh, we thought it was going to be really easy. It's, oh yeah, you know, above 80 Gs or something like this, uh, you're going to get concussed and anything else is sub-concussive. Well, so of course, life doesn't work that way. And um, we had lots of people who were getting diagnosed, and there's a caveat there, with concussion, um, who uh, had, yeah, really high hits, 100, 110 G, and so forth and so on, um, which made sense. Uh, wicked high hits, wicked high chance of having concussion. Um, on the other hand, we also had a lot of people who were getting diagnosed with concussion with um, impacts of, at half that um, magnitude, so 50, 60 G and so forth. And um, what was more is that uh, in the care data, and Steve, you can speak to this uh, better than I can, I think, but about a third of the people that we've collected who have concussion um, diagnosed concussion by the medical staff and so forth, um, you can't identify which hit it was. Um, and there's no so-called smoking gun impact that allows you to say when you review the video and everything, oh yeah, that was the one. Um, and so that raises the whole question in my mind of whether subconcussive even makes sense. We can't define what a concussive hit is. So it, it's beyond me how we can call something a subconcussive hit because they, I don't know where that where to draw that line. So I think the notion of head impact is probably a better one. And then I'll just I'll shut up in a minute. But basically, the um, that also raises the question of individual thresholds to the effects of neurotrauma. So I don't know whether you see this in your mice as well, Bill. I'd be interested to hear about that. I think you probably do. Would be my guess. Um, and also the context. So what else is going on in the in the head impact measurement studies from from care, uh, and actually predating care. The um, there, it looks like there are a couple of different pathways to being diagnosed with a concussion. One is with the wicked big hit. And the other is um, lots of hits over short periods of time that are um, out of proportion to what the athlete has been used to being exposed to, almost as if there's a priming or some sort of, you know, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, kindling effect uh, from repetitive head impacts in some people. So I think that just opens up a whole other uh, set of avenues of investigation. Like it, Bill. Anything else, or we can keep on keeping on. Uh, you can keep on keeping on. I All think. right. Well, um, okay. So um, next qu question from the audience here: um, Can the panelists talk about the risk of prolonged delayed onset of cognitive impairment in athletes or the general population with one or more non-complex uh, MTBIs? Uh, they suggest non-complex is a complete recovery within one to two weeks and no com comorbidities, hypertension, substance abuse, et cetera. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. And, um, you know, we could, we could sort of answer that question in, in some of the track TBI data that's available if you ask for it. Um, uh, that's a very good question, you know? And so I'll just answer a slightly different question. So we're looking right now in the track TBI. So track TBI is a study of all severities of TBI, right? But we're looking just, um, patients coming to trauma centers fall for one year. So we're looking just in those with mild TBI, GCS 13 to 15. Of course, because it's the track TBI study and these are level one trauma centers, the majority of them were mild, uh, but they were complicated. They had a positive head CT, right? Um, and in that population, um, across all the ages in the study, you know, which is, you know, from 18 to 90, you know, so it's a big range, but the average is about 40. Um, we do see that um, about, you know, depending on how you define poor cognitive outcome, and we've thought a lot about this, and we're including both people who just have chronic impairment uh, based on normative scores, against population norms and also people who have some amount of clinically significant cognitive decline over the year. Um, it's, it's not a ton of people actually that fall out into the impaired group at the end of the day, maybe 10% um, when you kind of, you know, use some pretty strict definitions below, you know, ninth percentile for cognitive impairment. And this is data we'll be publishing imminently 
Um, so look out for it. But that's an excellent question. I mean, it's a, it's a really important question. Yeah. Let right. um, me know your thoughts, Bill. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think I want the, the folks who are listening to understand why we're being so cautious. I think sometimes you read all this stuff in the media and you think, well, I thought this, this whole thing was settled. Um, you know, in most of my work, you will find that the guys who recall more concussions um, are currently having uh, higher levels of depression or anxiety or um, cognitive difficulties. I am always cautious to interpret that, though, because this is classic recall bias. If you've you studied epidemiology, the folks who are now having symptoms that in their mind they attribute to concussions are gonna be more likely to recall them than the, the folks who are symptom free. And so I think it's important to note it and, and I publish it. I think, oh, look here, there was an association, but I'm always cautious about over-interpreting it because I uh, ideally, we would collect it as it went on. So we would know how many concussions they got over the years and decades later, we would measure their function. And obviously, uh, that has not been done. Uh, the, the other thing that sort of stands out in our work from NFL Long is if you put the, the pub papers that we published together so far, instead of just saying less than three or three or more, we broke it into broader categories. And actually, even with the caveat of there's a lot of recall bias, the, um, or the potential, I suppose, for recall bias, the, it's really those who had nine or more that are driving the symptoms dry, or recall nine or more that are driving the symptoms. And so, you know, I don't know where they straightforward recoveries, were they complicated? And of course, most of these guys are getting hit by another guy who's like 300 pounds and much stronger than I. And so it's hard to extrapolate that much farther, um, but we only know what we know. All right. Um, so we have a question. It sounds like it might be a clinician. I'm not sure they don't, they don't totally identify um, the profession this is what do you recommend i say to my healthy 20 something patients who have had either their first or fifth concussion and are worried that they're um, predestined to uh, getting dementia in the future often their primary care emergency provide emergency care provider has warned them of the risk and by the time i see them their anxiety is off the chart i, I might jump in here well tom go ahead sorry yeah, I have this conversation every day, and I, I think it's important to, to note a couple things. So um, I will tell them, first of all, it's very unlikely that somebody will get one mild, straightforward sport-related concussion and go on to get dementia as a result of that. So I, I note to them, look, dementia is unfortunately common and, and getting more common among non-athletes just you know in the population. And so you're at risk, just like we're all at risk. Like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> there is no convincing evidence that sustaining a few sport-related concussions is going to increase that risk in any substantial way. And so I usually tell them I had, for, 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 for those, I, I played rugby all the way through college. I played lacrosse prior to that. Um, and I had a, several injuries. And so if I'm lucky enough that I've had as many or more than them, I tell them I had as many as you and I don't even think about. It. Like, you know, my risk is high because my grandparents had it, my mother died from it. So my risk is that, but those concussions, I'm not thinking about those at all. Um, at the same time, I don't want you going on and getting more and then all of a sudden I am worried about it and now we're trying to decide. So I tell them you, you have to know that there is likely some risk, that it's difficult to quantify, that I'm not worried about the ones you had now if you've had a few, but um, I don't wanna see you get any more. And even though I can't quantify it, I think you, you got to weigh the risk against the benefits. So if, if, if it's a guy who's debating between ice hockey and tennis, sweet, that's an easy one, play tennis. If it's, you know, football's my life and I'm a really big, strong, powerful guy, but I can't run that much. I'm, you know, I'm 250 or whatever, and I just can't tolerate, I'm not an endurance guy and it's either football or nothing. I think it's a harder decision and we sort of try to work our way through it. Very good. Okay, um, so Bill, this one's a little bit directed to you, but I'll, I'll open it up to everybody. I'll just add Sorry. one thing to that, which is that <laughs> if they're coming to you because they're worried about their brain health, I would see it as an opportunity to educate them about how they can optimize their brain health over their life course, apart from this concussion, right? So we know a lot about how to optimize brain health through the life course and with aging, right? And so I would encourage them to lead a brain healthy lifestyle, right? And that's probably going to be far and away much more important for them than um, 
than you know whether or not they're playing more high school football, right? Um, you know, we've also not seen any elevated risk of neurodegenerative diseases sort of on a population level in high school um, football players, right? Compared to non-high school football players, right? So when you're at sort of that junior level, um, you know, I think it's far more important to, to be trying to develop healthy, healthy lifestyles or brain healthy lifestyle behaviors, right? What's that? So, you know, being an athlete and playing sports is a really brain healthy um, thing to do, right? Um, and uh, avoiding toxins to the brain, right? Avoiding smoking, avoiding drugs, et cetera, right? So I think those things are far more important. Um, at the same time, um, you know, I think a lot of it, Bill, has to do with the substrate, right? So what's the brain that you're starting with? And I think Tom started to touch on this, but um, you know, you injure the brain that you have, right? And some brains are more vulnerable and some brains are more resilient, right? And so, um, you know, it, it may not be fair for you to compare yourself, Bill, to, to necessarily a student who maybe doesn't have the same substrate that you were born with, right? Genetically, et cetera, et cetera, right? You've gotten very far in life despite all the, all the concussions, but, but it may be, we don't know that not everyone would have been able to do that after all the concussions, right? If they had a different genetic makeup than you, if they had a different life course than you, if they had a different level of education than you. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a tough, it's tough. It's tough to, to counsel those people. Um, and uh, we do see in veterans, even with one prior TBI, um, worse processing speed and executive function 40 or 50 years later, you know? So these are mild TBIs that they might've had, you know, when they were a teenager and then, you know, comparing veterans with and without TBI, we, we can see a little trace of it even decades later. In highly educated retirees in Marin County, California, we see nothing, absolutely nothing, zero, zero footprint from their prior TBI, right? So I think a lot of it has to do with the substrate, right? And that's the, that's the wild card that you just don't know when you're counseling these, these young kids. Great point. Let me, let me, let me pile on if I could, I mean, not to Bill, but I will comment. Just think of how much farther you'd be in life, uh, Bill, without all those concussions. I mean, that's the other way of looking at this. I, the, I might be uh, in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the other issue, rightly or wrongly, that I used to, um, you know, sort of bring into the converse, this kind of conversation with people is to, okay, over the course of your X number of concussions, what's the recovery trajectory been like? Because I think there's a, a phenotype of people who begin, whether it's after one, after two, after 10, to show a, um, a decline or degradation in the rate of recovery of symptoms after concussion. And for me, if it were my kid, um, you know, and I saw that kind of um, pattern, I would be, you know, a lot more adamant about saying, hey, this, this really may not be the, the right activity for you. Um, and you may want to think very, very seriously. And kids don't think all that clearly at that point, obviously, um, for a variety of reasons. But I think for me, that was also another um, indicator of um, how concerned to be or how heavy to get in terms of advising um, alternative um, activities and lifestyles. But uh, you guys may not agree with that. Uh, no, actually, let me expand on it a little because I agree 100%. I, I think the, the questioner specified that, that that was not the case, that these were sort of straightforward and, and real quick recoveries. But I agree 100%. We look at increasing recovery time. We look at worse symptoms with successive injuries. We look at whether or not they seem to be occurring with less and less force. Uh, we look at whether or not they have deeper cognitive declines with successive injuries. So we look at all of these things, absolutely. And we counsel them away from it. And then just to reemphasize the point that Dr. Gardner made, um, you know, there for, for the athletes that I'm looking at, sort of 50 to 70 year olds who played in the past, you know, they can't go back and change their concussion concussion history. But she's absolutely right that if you um, change your sleep habits and if you change your diet and uh, the point that she emphasized, which is the amount of exercise you're getting now, the beneficial effects of that on your health related quality of life now offset most of the association that we see due to the repeated concussions you sustain with the exception of cognition. Now, in cognition, it'll offset a lot of it, but not all of it. But for depressive symptoms and anxiety and emotional behavior discontrol, you can actually offset most of it um, by doing that. So it's sort of a, a workaround or, or to a point, increasing brain health. Very good. Um, so Bill, this one's a little bit directed to you, but I'll, I'll open it up. I think it applies to everybody here. Um, so 
in one of your responses um, a few minutes ago, you had mentioned neurological health of um, the NFL, retired NFL athletes. Many studies, um, and I'm guilty of this as well, we, we, um, we benchmark uh, neurological health against the general population, um, which um, I'm not familiar with this phrase, but um, I guess it, um, it's called the healthy worker effect. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else knows that, but um, our investing bill in your work, Raquel, Tom, um, are you moving towards um, comparing retired athletes to other retired athletes uh, in order to at least try for control for fitness and wealth, fame, baseline cognitive ability, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's kind of a, a second part to this. Um, should the reference group uh, being determined also uh, match to race or try to match to race? Yeah, so it's an insightful question. It depends a little bit what your hypothesis is. So if you're trying to assess the effect of concussion, your ideal control would be age match, race matched, former NFL player who got zero concussions versus someone who had some number that you designate as your minimum or more of your threshold. And so we do that absolutely. If you're trying to determine the effect of sub concussive blows, which I agree with everything that Dr. McAllister said previously about how complicated that term is, um, then it's a little tougher because there are so many other differences between a former professional NFL player and everybody else in the world, other than the fact that they were subjected to sub concussive blows, their training regimen, which the questioner alluded to, the fact that their career peaked when they were 26 and then their whole life changed and they had to find a backup plan of any don't. It takes an enormous amount of effort and time and energy to become a professional football league player. You don't really have a lot of time to plan for your backup, you know, and it, you worry it might diminish your chances. So it's hard to find a control for them. We've thought about it. We've thought about trying to control for the resistance training by getting uh, bodybuilders is maybe a control. But of course, they have other differences too. And um, the use of ergogenic aids between those two populations is different. And um, it's just sort of hard to control. Other athletes, it could be. And now you'd have to take them out of collision sports, probably out of contact sports if you're trying to assess for subconcussive blows. And when you do that, boy, there's a lot of other differences between those athletes, including their longevity. You know, the athletes playing golf and baseball and stuff, they tend to play a lot longer than guys playing in the NFL on average. Everybody thinks Brady, but like he's a big exception. So, um, so it's hard. And, and I don't have a great answer for that. I'll defer to the other two guests if they have better control of this. Maybe not. Tommy, I, mean, I, got nothing. I, got, I got nothing. Got nothing. All right. Sounds good. Um, Raquel, this one is uh, towards you. Um, so the, the audience member here um, indicates you mentioned that incredibly interesting topic of examining res uh, resistance and resilience factors that protect against or increase risk for uh, neurodegenerative disease after head trauma. Um, the, the, member, the audience member is saying, I struggle personally with how we say with confidence that non-CTE neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's or Lewy body disease is a head trauma related version of that disease versus a sporadically occurring disease. Do you have any thoughts on how we might increase our confidence that the non-CTE neurodegenerative diseases is in fact attributable to prior head trauma? Great question. Yeah, so, you know, um, to date, I believe that only repetitive head impacts and sometimes blast, right? Maybe sometimes single blast, right? Has been associated with CTE neuropathology, right? Um, and the single head injuries, which is what I mostly study, have just in, you know, been broadly associated with increased risk for a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. And there've been a lot of studies looking at increased risk of Parkinson's, all-cause dementia, some subtypes of dementia. Um, and, and the truth is for Alzheimer's disease, I'd say there's the least amount of evidence for kind of a direct causal link between single TBI and Alzheimer's neuropathology. So, you know, the DOD ADNI study didn't find any association with Alzheimer's pathology. The Crane neuropathology uh, large two cohort study didn't find any association with Alzheimer's neuropathology. But what has been seen now somewhat consistently is an association with alpha synuclein and microvascular ischemia. Um, and so I, I, I think that, you know, those two neuropathologies, um, you know, may be more um, tightly associated with um, TBI exposure, and there may be a pathophysiological mechanism that is still, you know, to be determined. Um, it's also still possible that, you know, studies haven't been adequately powered to find an 
association with actual Alzheimer's neuropathology. But, you know, I think that, be that as it may, right, I think what causes dementia, right, is sort of a bigger question, right? Um, and in general, I think that for, for most humans, um, it's more than one thing, right? Unless you have an autosomal dominant, you genetically, you know, genetic Alzheimer's disease, right? Usually the reason that you have a neurodegenerative disease is gonna be multiple risk factors all converging together, right? To give you whatever age of onset that you end up with, right? And it's gonna be a variety of maybe genetic risk factors, environmental risk factors, um, health risk factors and, and many things, right? Plus, you know, the brain reserve that you started out with, right? How high was your education, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and so, you know, the way I think about traumatic brain injury and neurodegenerative disease is that it's one of many risk factors, right? That will likely, you know, if you're destined to get a neurodegenerative disease, having that traumatic brain injury might make you get it sooner, right? Earlier, um, it might make you manifest symptoms of, of a neurodegenerative disease, um, you know, whereas before, before you die, you know, whereas maybe someone else would have, you know, died in their late eighties and never manifested those symptoms, right? So, um, you know, I think you can think about it in terms of a direct causal link to a specific neurodegenerative pathology, and there may be that, and I think especially alpha and microvascular disease. Um, but I, I think of it also as, as almost taking out a chunk of your biological brain reserve, right? That's going to destine you for, for a neurodegenerative disease sooner than you would have had it otherwise. So that's sort of how I frame my thinking about, about the, the link these days based on the extant sort of literature that we have. Bill, Tom, any, any add-on? Uh, I, I have an add-on question for uh, Raquel, if I, if, if I might. I, I think one of the other um, issues that people often bring up is that, um, is it a risk of, um, higher risk of de relative risk of dementia, or is it uh, what you're talking about a minute ago, uh, if you have a, um, a brain injury and it reduces your cognitive reserve, let's say, uh, whatever that is, uh, and you were destined to get Alzheimer's anyway, it's just showing up earlier. And therefore, um, so the threshold of symptomatic cognitive decline becomes more evident at a younger age, and that's inflating the risk um, of that. So could you share your thoughts on that? Sure, yeah. So, and I think um, the DOD ADNI study is kind of really compelling in that regard in that they compared, you know, veterans with a TBI to those without TBI, and those, um, and those um, with TBI, while they while they didn't actually have any more amyloid in their brains on amyloid PET or on CSF my markers, right? They did have more cognitive impairment. Actually, they had more MCI, uh, um, and so you know that's very interesting, you know, and and maybe some of them even had amnestic MCI. Right from that amyloid that they had, but but they're you know and 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 a veteran without TBI, right, who also had a positive amyloid scan, didn't have MCI. So that you can sort of see that they're kind of manifesting cognitive impairment, cognitive symptoms that's giving them a diagnosis of MCI even without having that amyloid pathology. It also, of course, could be that they have other neuropathologies, right, not amyloid. Um, but I think it's interesting. We see a similar effect with level of education, right? So someone with um, a low level of education is going, to is going to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's at an earlier age than someone with a very high level of education, even with the same level of amyloid deposited in their brain, right? So it's sort of a similar effect that we see with education. So that's why I sort of think of it at least, you know, in part as a biological brain reserve um, kind of metric. Does that, make so Does that answer your question? Thank you. Tom, um, if you could please submit your questions through the Q&A, that would be awesome. Thank you. You mean I can't jump the line? What the heck? <laughs> um, okay. Um, from the audience, in your opinions, where is the CTE field headed next? Um, which pre-mortem test do you think will be uh, the, the quote, best to detect pathophysiology down the road? Biomarkers, imaging, um, can we use some of those biomarkers now perhaps to help manage concussion or concussion recovery? <laughs> well, 
Um, where is it heading next? I mean, I think the, um, for one thing, the efforts to try and define the clinical syndrome, which then develops into the neuropathological syndrome that we end up defining as CTE, I think are really good. Um, you know, so the, the group that um, is, has tried to establish research diagnostic criteria, for, clinical research diagnostic criteria for TES. I, I, think, I think that's a worthwhile endeavor because it will allow us to then test the uh, various parameters that the questioner just asked in terms of how useful are they. At this point in time, we have to wait until people are, are dead. And, and that's just going to take a long time to get there. But, you know, we went through this with Alzheimer's. So defining um, possible, probable, uh, almost almost certain um, Alzheimer's and then neuropathological Alzheimer's. And that, that was enormously helpful. It got everybody defining the populations more or less the same way and allowed more coherent testing. So I think that's one really big um, step. The, the, the other, uh, in terms of um, you know, biomarkers and imaging and so forth and so on, I don't think there are at this point in time any um, TBI specific biomarkers, whether it's imaging or fluid biomarkers or anything, with the possible exception of certain genetic uh, genotypes or what have you that might make you, um, you know, um, in, enhance your predictive ability of who's going to get CTE. I mean, there's or dementia. I mean, so again, I'd, I'd like to toss it to uh, my, my fellow panelists in terms of the current story on, for example, APOE4 allele and its relation and its interaction with TBI and what that does to the relative risk over and above, if anything. Um, but I think that as a paradigm is something that is the next big field in CTE is trying to understand or concussion in general. It's like if if we if we stipulate that there are individual thresholds for who gets a concussion in the first place, I don't think it's a big leap to think that there's individual um, uh, genotypes. Uh, which will modulate the recovery from concussion. And if you then string that together with multiple concussions and head impact exposure, I don't think it's a big leap at all. Um, and it's certainly testable over time to begin to think about a genetic uh, risk profile in which instead of saying, well, how many concussions have you had? Well, let's, let's run a panel here. Oops, you know, you've got nine out of the 10 genetic risk uh, alleles here. You might want to think about tennis or a chess club or something like this. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. I think uh, I agree with everything Tom said. And um, I'll just add, I mean, in terms of just recovery from concussion, um, we've learned, I think over the past several years that having certain pre-existing feet characteristics, right? Makes it more likely that you won't have a good recovery, right? So if you already had migraine headaches before, right? Chances are you're gonna have more post-concussive symptoms after, right? So, I mean, this gets at sort of the substrate, the, the brain resilience, brain reserve. Um, you know, the, the, the one study that I can think of that to me was sort of the most compelling evidence that maybe there really is a link with Alzheimer's disease, pathology and concussions, um, and this has to do with genetic risk. Um, you know, looked at, at people who have a high um, polygenic risk score for Alzheimer's disease, young people, military um, in their maybe 20s, 30s. Um, and there was an interaction with TBI exposure on an AD pattern of atrophy in these young brains, right? People had a very high Alzheimer's disease polygenic risk score and also had TBI had more atrophy in AD, Alzheimer's disease specific regions, hippocampus, other regions, right? Um, you know, is it that people with a high polygenic risk score are more likely to do something um, that reflects poor judgment and sustain a traumatic brain injury? You know, that could be an explanation, right? Or is it really that there's a link there, right? So I think, you know, there's a lot, um, there's a lot that we still don't understand. I think about, about how the, the role of these genetic risk factors um, and some of these polygenic risk um, scores can teach us about, about recovery after TBI and long-term effects. All right. Bill, you look like you want to answer, maybe not. Nope. Okay. Um, what evidence is there that later in life TBI can accelerate a latent degenerative process versus being a causative agent, sort of like a prion propagation theory? So I think we've touched on this a little bit, but maybe there's a little more to 
add in here. Maybe not, maybe we said it all. <laughs> Nothing, okay, we'll just go. We'll go I don't have anything intelligent to add, so. Okay. Um, That's fine. Late life TBIs are not my thing. I'm more earlier okay. in, the, in the Fair life. enough, fair enough, all right. Um, okay, uh, following up on the clinical syndrome that Tom had just mentioned, what is the panel's opinion of the recently released TES criteria, specifically the criteria which requires a minimum of five years of organized football with a minimum of more than two years at the high school level or above. Dr. McAllister, I'm gonna look at you first because you were a co-author on that paper. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure whether that's a blessing or a curse, but the, um, I, I, I think we, we spent an enormous amount of time, and I'm not, I'm not part of the, the um, diagnosed CTE study. I just happened to be one of the, the voting members on the, on the panel that, sort of tried to reach a consensus um, thinking about the, the uh, diagnostic criteria. And, you know, as you might imagine, <laughs> there were as many opinions about that in the room as there were panelists and then some, so people might change their mind or, or whatever. And so I, I don't think we're um, in any way um, close to having evidence to suggest that five years shall be the number, you know, like Monty Python, three shall be the number, or, you know, five shall be the number. It's just sort of, um, I think it was what we were, the, the tension in the room had more to do with um, avoiding, um, you know, uh, well, it, achieving plausible exposure to hit repetitive head impact exposure. And the thinking was, yes, you get impacts, for example, at youth football, but obviously you get more if you're playing high school, especially high school at a high level. Uh, but if you just play high school for one year, is that really going to be enough? We don't know. Um, and so I think the at the other end of the extreme, uh, we didn't want to make it only NFL players uh, have have this kind of exposure. So it was to try and get at this idea of um, where you're more than an occasional participant in head impact exposure, uh, but you don't have to be at the crazy, not the crazy, but the far end of the exposure being an NFL player. Because as Bill said, you know, there's there are a lot of things that are different about NFL players, for example, than um, or NHL players or what have you. So it was an attempt to come down somewhere in the middle. So um, actually, I'd be curious to hear what other people think about uh, about where it landed. I guess I'll weigh in a little because I, I found it difficult to, to do. So the, the way I think of it normally is you have some disease, some unique disease entity, um, and then you look for risk factors for it. So you, you say, oh, uh, people have a heart attack. And it turns out that smoking is a, is a massive risk factor for suffering a heart attack. And then you say, okay, well, smoking is a risk factor. And now that's awesome because maybe if we get people to quit smoking, they're less likely to get a heart attack. And for me, I look at it the same way. If, if traumatic encephalopathy syndrome is a unique diagnosis, then to me, head trauma would be a risk factor for it. And so it's hard. Uh, and so I personally would not have put it in the definition. If you, if it's a unique syndrome, then maybe head trauma makes you more likely to get it, but it shouldn't be that if you didn't do that, you can't have it. You know, like the uh, same with dementia. I just said that my mother just recently died of dementia. And of course she was not a football player, never had a head injury in her life that was notable that, that anybody would recall. And so I, I'd be reluctant to do it. And if you look at the pathology study in Canada, it was a, a pathologist named Shauna Noy. And I, the, I think the senior author was Mark Del Biggio, but if I'm wrong about that, I apologize. But he, they said, look, if you only look in football players, you're not gonna find this thing in football players. So let's, let's stain the brains that come into our lab. You know, men, women, former athletes, non-athletes, people with head trauma, people without it. And it did suggest that head trauma was a risk factor. I think it was 48% of, of those who were in the morgue that got stained for, for CTE according to the, before the consensus criteria, so hyperphosphorylated tau, the depths of the sulci anyway, um, had it. But of people who had, were substance abusers, it was 42%. And, and those were people without head trauma. And if you put them together, it was like 54%. I apologize if I'm getting the numbers wrong, but it, they're, they're easy to find. But even if you took away everybody with, with head trauma and everybody who had substance abuse, still 20%, one out of five people had hyperphosphorylated tau at the depths of the cell size. So uh, if it were me, I would say if traumatic encephalopathy syndrome is a unique syndrome, we 
we discuss it as a syndrome and what, what is it defined as it's as much as clinical features, maybe symptoms or physical signs you see. And then I would say, okay, do people have a history of playing football have this syndrome more than people who play golf? And if so, now it's a risk factor, but it's not part of the definition. I guess that's the way I would have, I would have approached it. I would venture to not, I wasn't on the panel, right? That created the, the um, definitions. So I'd be curious to hear what, what Tom has to say about my thoughts. Um, but I would venture to say that perhaps what we're looking at here is sort of an issue and a tension between sensitivity and specificity, right? So these are research criteria. These aren't meant to be, you know, the be all and end all clinical definition and criteria, right? These are, these are supposed to be used predominantly for research purposes to create more homogeneous clinical cohorts of people who are likely to have CTE neuropathology, right? And so to do that, you probably want to err on the side of a specific definition. And so, you know, have people with really a lot of repetitive head trauma exposure, right? As opposed to being very, very sensitive and getting, you know, um, you know, trying to find every single person who might possibly have it, right? Because I think the goal is to help facilitate these prospective cohort studies, right? So, so I think there's a tension here, right? Between having a definition which is, which is you know, all inclusive and very sensitive versus specific. I don't know, Tom, if that was part of the. Yeah, no, that absolutely was. And it was made clear and it may not be as clear in the paper uh, or the article um, at the end of the day as it was in the room. But I mean, there was a repetitive kind of, these are research, clinical research diagnostic criteria, which are meant to test some of the very things, Bill, that you're, um, that you found disappointing in it at some level or, or disagree with how it was framed. So it's exactly right. It was sort of say, okay, let me, we got to set the marker somewhere for what plausible um, exposure might be. And you could argue all day for what that is. Is it five years? I, I don't know. Could be so, you know, surely God loves a 0.06 as much as a 0.05, right? I mean, it's sort of uh, along those lines. But I think that um, it, it was an, an it was the next step in the evolution of this idea of a, a TES. The first being, you know, Bob Stern and his crew um, just proposed some some criteria based on their review of clinical records that they had from Ann McKee's group, as I understand it. And it got a lot of pushback um, as anytime somebody does something like that, they'll get some pushback. So then this was a next step to try and, okay, so people don't like that there was a little bit loosey goosey in some areas. Let's try and tighten it down a little bit and um, at least set a marker for what um, exposure uh, is. And if it turns out then at the end of the day that um, the uh, people with that level of exposure have no difference in their uh, density of p tau in the depths of the sulci than um, you know people who don't have that exposure. Then it wasn't a very good idea. But without at least drawing the line somewhere, you're not going to know that. I think so. Yes, Raquel, that was a long-winded way of saying that was exactly <laughs> uh, sort of behind a lot of the discussion. And I guess the risk is you know you're taking a risk, right? Because if in fact um, it's so specific that you're missing a lot of the people who have the pathology, right? By using that definition, it's sort of a risk, right? So, um, cause I think we're still only scratching the surface of understanding, you know, what are all the risk factors for having CTE or pathology, right? Bill, maybe that's sort of what you're getting at as well. I mean, domestic violence is a big one. I mean, I would question whether all those substance abusers really didn't have traumatic brain injury. I mean, I, I work with the track TBI team. We see a lot of people coming into our EDs um, over and over and over again, who are substance abusers who don't remember that they had a TBI, but they someone observed them um, having one, right? So, you know, I think um, uh, it's uh, it's tricky. The task of this uh, uh, this committee to create this definition was was very challenging, and I think they did an admirable job overall. <laughs> very good. Um, this is an interesting one. Can the panel speculate on the role of the glymphatic system in neurological disorders? Um, the glymphatic system is most effective with proper sleep. Can you, spe can you speculate how poor sleep, particularly in those with apnea, such as larger athletes, may have increased risk? Uh, so you, you can induce it. I mean, so, so to get to that, you know, in the noise study I referred to 
20% of, of people who had no substance abuse, no history of head trauma also had the hyperphosphorylated tau. In animals, you can induce it with hypoxia, um, including hypoxia that's meant to sort of be the animal laboratory model for sleep apnea. So I, I do think it's a good hypothesis. And of course, sleep apnea is also associated with worse performance on measures of cognitive function. And so um, I just think there's a lot there. And I guess I worry, you know, if the risk factor is a part of the definition, you're never going to be able to quantify the effect of the, the risk. That's all. Sure. Someone else is jumping on, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, so can the panelists speak about evidence relating to the timing of head impact exposure and concussion with respect to later life brain health in context of young athletes with developing brains participating in contact collision sports? Um, is there animal research to support that bill that's directed towards you? Um, just for the audience, I think we're getting around the question of the age of first exposure plus or minus 12 years old. So I will let you guys comment. Or maybe not. Nobody wants to take it. Go for it, Bill. In terms of animals. <laughs> I was going to say Tom, but uh, yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't want to get into the weeds too much here. And I, I have to say, we didn't say this at the beginning, but it, it, the NFL long study is funded by the NFL. So you got to take everything I said with a grain of salt and double check for yourself. And in fact, I want you to do it. I, I think if you need to read a basic fundamental text on epidemiology and then go back and read the studies, there's not that many, actually. There's a lot of opinion pieces. There's probably 50 studies that are directly relevant to these kind of questions. As far as the age of the trauma and the, the chance of a long-term problem, we don't know. So, uh, you know, th this has gotten a lot of media attention and everybody's saying below the age of 14 or below the age of 12, don't let them do it because the developing brain is more vulnerable to injury and blah, blah, blah. But there isn't, there isn't really a lot of evidence for that. And I can come back to the evidence part in a second. And in fact, historically in, in, in neurology and neurosurgery, something called the canard principle was suggested the exact opposite, that the developing brain was much more capable of responding to injury than the adult brain, and, and you would be less likely. And of course, there's been cases of pure hemispherectomies when young children, and when they're adults, you really can't tell. It's, it's very difficult to distinguish their neurological function from, from those who have a full brain. And, and almost every other injury on earth, a growing child recovers from much more effectively and much more quicker than a, in an adult. Now, it still, as I say, I don't know. It might not be true. It might be absolutely true that it's worse that if you get it as a young child, but we really don't have evidence either way. And I, I'll caution that by somebody might call and say, oh, I read this one study that said this. And yes, of course you did. Because one study will say anything. And, and the way we do it in medicine is you get a whole lot of studies. And ideally, they try to address a question from a bunch of different answers. And then you put them all together and, and you know, 85% of them are sort of pointing in one direction. You say, that's probably where the truth is over there. And um, so you can't look at one study. And my colleague, Grant Iverson, has a great slide about this where he puts up all the studies that had age and try to associate with, with outcome. And he calls all the people who say, oh, younger brain is worse or younger brain is better. And, and he shows, you just don't know. You know, this is sort of all over the place. And so I just think we have to be cautious about it. My take of the literature right now is we, we don't have any idea of the effect of age at the time of injury on a long-term outcome after multiple sport-related concussion. I can chip in a little bit from some of the indirect ways that um, some of the data from the CARE Consortium is, has looked at that. And Steve, <laughs> I don't know whether you're allowed to comment as the, the moderator, but, but you're familiar with this, uh, uh, obviously. Um, you know, so in the, in the uh, Bob Stern and his group published a work saying that in the NFL cohort, um, you know, exposure at a younger age, we're starting, I think, I think I have this right, um, uh, you, to football at a younger age was associated with a higher risk of, um, you know, symptoms that one might imagine might be uh, traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. So sort of neurobehavioral dysregulation, cognitive impairment and so forth. So that led uh, some of the folks in the, in, in the care group to say, well, let's look at that in our data with a lot of caveats. This was based on, you know, just participants saying, I started my primary sport uh, at age, you know, X, eight, nine, 12, 15, whatever it is. And um, then we also asked them, how many concussions have you had? So lots of noise in this because we're not quite sure how accurate people's assessment of how many concussions they've had are. But when all was said and done, 
um, at least in terms of the measures we use to assess people at their baseline when they were coming into uh, the care study. So freshmen in college um, or you know, first year cadets at the military service academies, there were no group differences uh, in any of the measures that we found, whether it was balance, whether it was uh, symptom report, whether it was cognition as measured by impact, um, so caveats there. Um, and uh, um, in, in any of the measures, basically. Now, this was true of football players. This was true of contact sport athletes. And then it was, it turned out to be, you know, true across the board. So it wasn't just football. So, you know, that doesn't address what they're going to be like when they come into Raquel's clinic, um, because they're not that age. Um, but it does uh, say that at least um, when they come in at age 18 or 19 or something, earlier onset of uh, exposure to repetitive head impacts was not associated with uh, you know, problems that we could pick up with the sensitivity of the instruments that we were uh, uh, using. And I will also say that when we did a, a much smaller study um, at, at, at Dartmouth, including MRI and so forth, we couldn't find any difference in terms of imaging, uh, whether it was um, DTI or uh, any other kind of um, MRI-based um, uh, change as well between contact sport athletes um, who are coming in and uh, the non-contact sport athletes. So that's not the full answer to the question by any means, but it's at least... Um, a little bit reassuring, I think. All right, um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. We're gonna get uh, one more question, I think. Um, and we're getting this uh, a reasonable amount from the audience in various forms. How do we best communicate what is known to date to our key stakeholders, so our athletes, our parents, coaches, and athletic administrators? What's the message that we should be sending out? I imagine we'll have a group response to this one. I mean, go ahead, Bill. It looked like you were about to, to jump on this one. Oh, no, I was going to say, I feel like I'm talking too much. I was, I was purposely waiting for one of you guys. I'm happy to do it, but I, I would you rather I do it? <laughs> oh, go for it, man. Kick it off. Yeah, yeah okay. So I, I try to explain to them um, uh, a little bit about the evidence. And it depends a little bit on how much they want to know and, and how much they can take without me confusing them. So you got to tailor it to your audience. But I tell them, look, there is evidence that concussions can have a cumulative effect. That I would say, now I don't tell them this part, but actually even that evidence is super strong, but I, I believe it. And so I tell them, look, I think there is evidence that concussions can have a cumulative effect. For one or two straightforward sport-related concussions, that effect is so small, it's hard to find it as a researcher. So I just, not just me, like all researchers around, it's hard to find one or two sport-related concussions that have some effect on something that we're measuring in clinic. Nonetheless, in the animal models, if you give them close enough together with enough force, you can measure it over time. That is a fact. And so it's hard for us to quantify. I tell them the same thing I said before. If you or your child or whoever it is that we're, we're talking about in this scenario, has another option besides rugby, right? You're, I don't know, am I gonna play rugby or am I gonna play cr run cross country? You should do cross country because it, not only you're less likely to tear your ACL, you're less likely to get a catastrophic cervical spine injury. I mean, there's so many reasons why you should do that. If the answer is uh, it's either football or nothing, big strong guy, I really, all my buddies play, you know, my girlfriend's a cheerleader, nobody ever wanted to date me until I started playing football. I mean, these are real things, you know, especially for the, teenagers that I see, we say, okay, is there another way for you to get that, that exercise, that sort of social credo, whatever you're getting right out of it? And if yes, sweet, what is it? Well, shop, but awesome, super safe with your shop, right? If no, if the answer is football or nothing, then you have to look at the real counterfactual. And a lot of guys think it is, and I'm going to go do something else. They just don't do it. And so are the risks of playing outweighed by the benefits? I mean, on some level, we do this all the time. People play ice hockey know that once or twice a year, someone gets a catastrophic cervical spine injury playing ice hockey, right? And they think, well, that's rare. I'm going to do it. I love playing. My buddies are playing. I'm gonna... We just make it more upfront in these conversations. You know, when they come in and they're, they're wondering about it and um, I go through the evidence, what we know, what we don't know, and we try to make the best decision we can. And often it's multiple visits. 
Yeah, I, I have similar discussions. I, I, I think the, um, you know, for me, it, it often, I spent the first part of my career convincing people, trying to convince people that sometimes mild brain injury doesn't turn out so well and that there are effects related to it. And I'm spending the latter part of my career saying, you know, this is not the black, this is not the plague. This is not <laughs> the end of the world if you have a concussion. But um, uh, I think it's a risk benefit kind of uh, trade off. And then I usually go into what we were talking about earlier in terms of here are some of the things you ought to be looking for. And, and you enumerated them earlier in terms of um, you're getting more concussions with less force or apparent impact. You're taking longer to recover. The symptoms are worse, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those would be the warning signs. Um, even if football is your only option, um, that you ought to be thinking uh, much more seriously about a, uh, you know, a, a change in a change in activity. Raquel, you get the you get the cl the closing comment. Okay, um, so so as, as someone who sees mostly older people, right? I don't see the young athletes. Um, and therefore I have a very different perspective because I don't see how much they need this sport, right? So I take a very conservative standpoint. I mean, I, I would be a little bit perhaps more upfront about some of the long-term effects that, that I've observed in the research that I've done, right? About the uh, association of, of increased, you know, small but real increased risk of a variety of neurodegenerative diseases, even after one mild TBI, right? So, you know, I think it's important that people understand that there's that they're taking a risk, um, but, you know, everyone in your in their day-to-day -day lives decides what level of risk they're willing to take. I think even, you know, in the last couple of years of the pandemic, it's really come to the forefront, you know, how much risk are you willing to take on in your day-to-day -day life, right? It's something we do every day. Um, but I would, you know, be frank about what we know about the increased risk and not necessarily tiptoe around it. I mean, we do see it's, you know, there's a lot of epidemiological research now linking one traumatic brain injury, even mild, right, to incre increased risk. It's small, but it's there. Um, and a lot of things can offset it, but it's still there. So that's, that's what I would say. But, but uh, again, I, I don't see them when they're in the thick of it. So I have a different viewpoint. Fair enough. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, so on behalf of the Michigan Concussion Center faculty and staff, uh, I want to thank our panelists um, for their time today, the audience for their time today. I appreciate everybody bearing with us as we work through technology issues there at the beginning. Um, I hope everybody learned something today. I know I did for sure. Um, and I'm pretty sure we can all agree this is a crazy complex topic, a lot of work yet to be done. Um, so thank you to our panelists for all the work that they do. I'm sure there's multiple people on the call today that are also working in this space. So thank you for your contributions. Um, as a reminder, we're gonna post this talk on our website, concussion.umich.edu in a couple of days. And then feel free to follow us on Twitter at UMich Concussion. Um, next week, uh, we will be hosting John Letty from the University of Buffalo, who's going to be uh, talking on concussion physiology and how that informs treatment. Uh, that is on uh, Thursday, the 28th at four o'clock. So uh, feel free to dial back in and listen to what John has to say. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good evening. Take care.